expensive, very valuable war horses to bring them over here when you're going into new places with very little resources. It's not worth the risk. So they would have brought really tough, hardy, common horses of the day. Um, there are several places that we can uh, look to for horses coming into South Carolina in particular. And you can see the Vasquez de Ale, uh, I don't, uh, arrived in, uh, created Fort Royal. He had a good number of horses with them. And um, the uh, Menendez de uh, Avila uh, also brought horses up. DeSoto, his expedition came somewhat close. Some of his men may have come towards the coast. Uh, we can't prove for sure if he left any horses. But I thought it was worth mentioning that he was uh, fairly close to Charleston. Uh, another influx of Spanish horses came in 1704 when Colonel Moore had uh, sacked St. Augustine in Tallahassee to try and get rid of the Spanish, and that, the last Spanish settlements in that state. And he brought with him large numbers of Spanish cattle and horses back to uh, Beaufort. When we look at colonial Spanish horses, uh, the best thing to get people to get an idea of what they're like, most people are used to seeing Arabs and quarter horses these days. The colonial Spanish things we're looking for when we look at a marsh tacky is um, a really solid looking horse. Uh, the Spanish horses, they were very uh, utility oriented, meaning that these horses were able to thrive on basically nothing and take care of themselves. They had to be easy keepers. If they weren't, they died, basically. So these animals, they were designed um, with, with a lot of really good angles and uh, proportions that when you put them all together, it gives them the uh, uh, a confirmation that gives them the optimal use of their, their bones and their muscles. They're put together in, in such a way that uh, there's less wear and tear on their joints, on their backs, and they can go and go all day and not get tired. Uh, the horses have a very uh, slanted croup here compared to the Arab and the quarter horse. Um, the slanted croup helps them to get their rear legs underneath them. If you've seen some Spanish horses in action, they can whip around faster than you know what happens. They tuck those back legs underneath them, whip around, and you're going in another direction before you realize where you're going. Uh, you're also looking for a a long chest here, but it's actually quite thin. When you look at them head on, they're very thin. And a lot of people have this false sense that they're not a really robust horse because of those thin chests. But in actuality, it's an adaptation that helps the animal to radiate heat from its body. If you think of a, a roast beef, and you've got a whole roast beef that just come out of the oven. It's going to stay hot for a while, but when you start slicing up that roast beef, it's going to cool off faster and faster. So even though you've got a skinny chest, um, it is long, so they've got good lung capacity, but it's stretched out so that they can radiate heat. As a result, these horses don't tire very easily. Um, here, if you can, I don't know how good you can see it, but you Here's a stallion, Taggy Blue. He's got a very skinny chest. And this is a big breeding stallion, big by Marsh Taggy standards. And then you take a look at the Arab and the Quarter Horse, and they've got much broader chests than the Marsh Taggy does. Uh, again, the confirmation, you've got all these equidistant points, and uh, it, it really does serve them. And, um, you don't see too many arthritic tackies or tackies with feet problems or back problems. It's because they're put together to function the most efficiently that a horse's body can. And um, they've been this way for as long as folks can remember. So we, we believe that these are quite similar to the horses that would have come over um, in early times. And they stayed this way because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, some other Spanish horses here, the banker ponies. Look at that skinny, skinny chest here. Um, genetically, they are Spanish horses. We have the Florida crackers, um, again, very similar to the tackies. Actually, Florida crackers were called tackies uh, back before they changed the name in uh, the past century. Um, if 
any of you have read the book A Land Remembered, they, they talk a lot about tackies. Uh, you can see here that, that slanted croup like with the marsh tackies right here. And they're not very tall. They're going to average anywhere from about 13.5 to 15 hands. Typically, we see them around 14, 14.3. Uh, what the hunters have found is if they get too big, they, they just don't function in the woods. They become too klutzy, they can't get out from their own feet, you know, they just uh, get bound up in the mud. And so really, bigger's not better with these guys, but that doesn't mean they're weaker. You know, a small horse like this is going to carry out his rider, plus the deer drag it behind him and not get tired. Uh, some of the other colonial Spanish, you've got the Wilbur Cruz in, in Arizona, sulfur horses, and they look very Spanish in type. Uh, many of the Spanish horses are gated, although the marsh tackies haven't been specifically selected for gatedness. Uh, because they are Spanish, there is going to be a certain percentage of horses that are gated. If they're Spanish, it's going to show up sooner or later. With the sulfurs, you have some gateds. There are a lot of Florida crackers that are gated. A lot of the cow cowboys down in Florida don't want to tell you that they like gated horses. <laughs> it's more comfortable. Um, so many of the, the cracker horses are gated. Um, this is a horse of particular interest in that uh, they're, they're somewhat related to both the cracker and the marsh tacky, but we're not quite sure if we're getting to them in time. These are colonial Spanish that would have been found around Mississippi, probably Louisiana, Alabama. Uh, they are uh, very similar to the uh, cracker horses, but we can only find about three of them, and unfortunately they're all stallions. So uh, we're not sure where we're going to be able to go with this particular breed. They may have been lost. But uh, there are a few out there, and they're clearly very Spanish looking, and they are gated. We've been doing a major DNA study on these breeds to see where they all fit together. Uh, currently, Texas A&M has samples from about 100 marsh tackies. Uh, right now, we believe there's probably about 150 left total. We know where most of them are. Uh, there's probably some with the Gullah community that we haven't been able to reach yet. And uh, we've been working hard to develop a relationship through the Penn Center and some of the gullas on St. Helena to try and locate the rest of the tackies because they're in the same position that many of the other tacky owners are and that there aren't too many out there and once the older ones die off, that's it. At this point, every horse counts. So uh, I'm hoping that everybody that has one understands we all need to kind of cooperate together in order to save the breed. We've also been sending samples to the University of Cordoba. Uh, they're doing a large study in all the Spanish breeds around the world, uh, horses, cattle, goats, sheep. And um, Virginia Tech, our geneticist that's working the closest with the most back, he's Dr. Phil Sponenberg, and uh, he's our point person. He's been working with colonial Spanish horses for 30 years now. Uh, here's a scary part, so I'm not the historian. Um, we, we've gotten some anecdotal evidence that the marsh tacky was likely utilized by Marion's men, in particular as a dragoon horse. Um, the, the problem with the tackies was they were the common horse and often weren't thought of as important enough to even write about, so there isn't a lot written about them. Could I ask you to stop for a second while I change the tape? Between steps, it just says stay straight. So for instance, that little pine tacky, the white pine tacky that my friend Margie was riding in the picture a few slides back, you know, she was going full tilt on that horse and she could have carried a cup of water, you know, and just, you know. Um, gated horses are really popular with, with uh, older riders because, they, you know, they're, they're a lot less uh, hard on your back and, and uh, you know, the thing is for young riders, they want a horse that's going to run and jump, and a lot of the gated horses, they've got that really fast walk, and, and that's it. <laughs> but the thing is, a gated horse also is using its locomotion in a very efficient way. And for instance, um, some of the Mustangs out in 
out west that were infamous for not being able to be caught by the cowboys. A lot of them were gated horses that just outpaced the cowboys' horses because they didn't get tired. Yelsa? Okay, thank you. Uh, so Marion's men, I like this one because uh, this picture because it does depict a, a number of horses that clearly are not blooded horses. They had to have been the, the common horse of the day. Um, uh, we are suspecting that, you know, again, that the horses may have been used as dragoon horses. It would have made sense that the, the Brits on the bigger horses would have had a harder time following these horses. Marsh tackies are known for what the, the locals call knowing how to wear their own feet. Meaning these horses, they can get through anything and they really don't get themselves stuck in the mud. If they do get mired in the mud, they have a way of just kind of laying down and kicking out and they get themselves up and out. Whereas, uh, you know, some of the blooded horses, I don't know if you, any of you have ever ridden, you know, thoroughbreds or some of the higher spirited horses, but they tend to panic. Uh, tackies don't do that. You know, I've seen tackies get their legs completely bound up with ropes and they'll just stand there until, you know, they get unbound because they know they can't go anywhere. They don't panic because it doesn't serve their purpose to hurt themselves. And, and uh, so they're actually quite level at the horses. Uh, I've been trying to understand more about Marion's horses. I understand that the horse that was at the sweet potato dinner was probably his horse, Roger. Uh, Roger was his pet horse, which we think would have been one of the local horses, which would have been a Marsh Tacky. Uh, he hunted a lot on him. Hunt the Marsh Tackies were the preferred hunting horses of the locals here in the Low Country. They actually still are in many cases. Um, I came across this image, which is a, a, by a local artist, and uh, you know, he, he doesn't look like a blooded horse, so I'm assuming that he perhaps was thinking of Roger. The other horse, Ball, was clearly a, a blooded horse that he had got from the British, and so we doubt he was marsh tacky. We do know that the British used marsh tackies against <coughs> us, and quite effectively, although they didn't like it, they thought they were inferior horses, but they did manage to win some ground riding marsh tackies. And so uh, uh, the Brits had a chance to get on him as well. Yeah, this is an interesting painting that's actually in your state house in the Battle of the Cow Pens and uh, you know, associated with the story of the Black Bugler saving Washington's blood. Uh, the, the horse here is depicted just like the Marsh Tacky. Uh, the Gullahs, uh, they tended to have sorrel Marsh Tackies, and so this kind of comes in line with the type of horse that a Black Bugler at that time would have been riding. So, uh, the steakhouse. Um, after the war, we kind of have a, uh, a period of time where not anything, not much is written about tackies at all. But what we do know is the gullahs on the islands after the revolution uh, used them extensively for farming. These horses were ridden, they were plow horses, they delivered mail, they did it all. Uh, the men rode them, they were good mounts for the children, for the wives, anybody could ride a tacky because of that mild manner, that solid head uh, that you could really use them for everything. Uh, so they were common farm horse. I recently was at the Penn Center over in St. Helena and was able to get in their photo archives, so the turn of the century photos, and there were quite a number of them of marsh tackies. And so they were very widely distributed among the islands. But as the islands got developed in the later half of the last century, the marsh tackies little by little got moved out. Um, we're to the point now, as I said, we probably have about 150 horses. Uh, if we have maybe 20 or 30 we don't know about, we'd be lucky. The uh, focus of our uh, conservation efforts is uh, on a number of things. First, we have to define what is a marsh tacky. This is a really hard question because all the people that have marsh tackies have their own opinions of what it should be. Uh, luckily, most of those opinions are fairly similar, so we think we have a lot of common ground that we can have people work together to uh, refine and get the definition of the tacky down. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work the past couple of years to discover new lines. Um, 
I've been down in South Carolina, I can't tell you how many times in the past two years, and uh, still managing to discover new horses. Just a few weeks ago, I found a new stallion that we didn't know about, and I'm kind of excited about that because I don't think he's related to anything else. And the documentation and the documentation and history. That's where we come, become dependent upon people like yourselves because my forte is not South Carolina history and I have to depend upon others to uh, help us understand where these forces uh, come into play with the local history. Um, as far as the confirmation, again, you know, part of that definition of what it is, do we pick just the small horses? Do we pick ones that look Spanish or do we look at one that has a nice gait, but maybe not gated in particular. Uh, do we look for horses that are good in the field, you know, as opposed to horses that spook in the water? One Marsh Tacky owner had told me, if a horse goes in the water and it panics, then it's not a Marsh Tacky. Well, do we use that as part of the definition? Um, so you can see it becomes a fairly complicated issue when you're trying to describe a horse. The one thing that everybody does agree upon is the tacky should have good common sense, steady heads, and they shouldn't be quick to panic. If they are, those shouldn't be horses that should be bred. They have been messed up in 500 years, and we want to keep them that way. Uh, we've been doing a lot of evaluation when we do find tackies. If somebody says they have a tacky, we don't automatically say, okay, we'll put it down in the record book. What we do is we look at the animal, we document the animal, we're looking at it for type, we're also evaluating the, the oral history of that particular horse. Where did it come from? How do you know it's a tacky? What's your experience with tackies in the past? I mean, it, it, it's a very tedious job to try and document that. And then we try to develop that story even further and try to understand any of the other horses that might be related to that particular one. You know, there are strains within the breed. And so uh, we try to document that as well. Um, as I said, they can, the documentation process can sometimes be very complicated. The owners right now are really itching for a stud book, and until we can get the DNA evaluations and, and get fit a, a couple more pieces into the puzzle, we're kind of at a standstill. But we're getting there, and uh, right now we're uh, concentrating on documenting history. Genetic conservation is often a balancing act. Uh, you're looking at, uh, you want genetic variation, but you also want something that's going to be somewhat predictable. Uh, the, the challenge is to uh, define the breed, and then if some animals seem to be outside of that definition, but we know for sure that it is uh, within the breed's, uh, it, say for instance, I'm trying to put we have a definition of a tacky. Let's say we have a horse that uh, is a little bit smaller. Maybe it was raised on an island and um, doesn't look exactly like some of the, the tackies that are in the mainland. Do we exclude him because he's small or do we consider him a, a valuable genetic resource because he's not related to anything else? And so it's a bit of a, a balancing act. Um, the, one of the big challenges that we started out with, but it's worked out quite nicely, was networking. Uh, there was one gentleman that thought he was the only person left with Marsh Tackies. Well, as it turns out, now we've got probably 40 people that have them. Might have one here, one there, three there. Uh, but we've been able to put together a group of folks that all have Tackies, and the one thing they all have in common is they don't want to see their horses disappear. So we did start out with an open house. Uh, you're going to meet David Grant uh, later on this afternoon. The, the open house was at his place. But this was the first time all the owners got together and met face to face. Some of them knew each other, but this was the first time they had all got together. So that was uh, quite, a, quite an experience for many of them. And then we continued to have meetings. We had two more meetings. Some of you were at the Mullet Hall meeting. Uh, which is where they decided, okay, we're going to form uh, an official association. And so they have uh, now got the official Carolina Marsh Tacky Association, and they have a board of governance that is working on putting together bylaws 
and trying to put together the infrastructure so that they can have an official association and function as a normal uh, nonprofit. They're very special. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Hunter and he uses his tactics. I mean, he is out in the field in the roughest spot you can imagine, Hog Hunt, and uh, he can tell you how they perform in the field. We have a young couple that's bringing a pair of tackies. They're just starting to get into it. And then we have uh, Jansen Cox, who's bringing his mare, who he says is the best uh, reenactment force in the state. And, uh, Gorgeous stallion, <laughs> such old, and this is Polly, a little filly. So, uh, David, if you want to talk about uh, your adventures with Mark's tractor. <laughs> Well, I say, I'm David Grantham from Florence, and it's my friend uh, Becky and Dusty Phillips. I've got them. Uh, what's that? You kind of lay the hay chips. You can't have a gun. 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 You uh, defeat, uh, very low maintenance. Uh, like I say, they just, uh, they really, and I have said it, uh, the Morris Tackle is probably the best kept equine uh, secret this century. Got it, got it. Buster David talked me into uh, doing both at the same time, but I really liked it. And, uh, uh, it started slow, but uh, I got this tune here, and uh, it, he's kind of, he's two years old, and uh, he doesn't really play all the time. That's his attitude. She all came in. I was like, good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Ori. Some of you may have heard about me. Some of you may not. That's quite a way I like this. You know, back in the day, I preferred to be a kind of quiet professional. I'd much rather talk about other people than about myself. But kind of need to help out because that partial wean scene keeps coming up. And because I got really upset that no one want to talk about Marion at the end of the war and everything he did. Well, I, I handed Parson Weems all that information I had in my journal. And boy, I read it later. I guess he didn't like my critique that I pretty much promised to break every bone in his body and move back down to South Carolina. But I understand more about Marion being a good leader than he was. You have to understand behind every good leader are good subordinates and good friends. And without them, and I'm proud to say that I was one of them, Mary wouldn't be able to be the effective real leader that he was today. And I think a lot of reasons why we were sort of friends and keeping the same background. Both our grandparents were all French Huguenots. They had been oppressed over in France. They decided to come over here, they got settled. We both were born in Georgetown. I was born near Georgetown on March 15, 1747. Marin was born, but then he moved away. I decided to hang out here and become a good Southern gentleman. And that was my whole role when I was growing up as a young lad. Learn how to be a good gentleman planner. Learn how to land, how to manage the crops, how to get into trade. But I started hearing, you know, as a gentleman, I started knowing more about Francis Marin, who also was growing up as a land gentry. He decided to win an adventurous role, go off to sea, and then when the war started against the Indians during the French and Indian War, he'd go off and led all of them in those battles. This brave man that could not be killed by bullets. He's like, you know, that might be a man I need to get to know. Someone especially dead, and the bullets can't hurt him. But in the French and Indian War, we realized things were starting to get a little bad. As a landowner, I could see that, you know, Trade was going bad. And my father died in 1770. Everything was put on my shoulders. My little plantation of 475 acres. But someone told me a key to being a good landowner is buy more land. So I started to invest. I started to you know, make my farms get bigger. But the problem with Great Britain, the, the trade, we couldn't get proper money for what we, we could get our, our resources for. Things would just start falling apart. We knew that trouble was soon coming. 
We all talk about ourselves, you know, all us children get together, Mary and the rest of us, and you know, I feel that there's something on the wind. And sure enough, it arrived in 75. Word got down to us that they started firing up in Lexington Concord. We need to get ready. So I decided to head to Charleston with the rest of the gentlemen, see what we're going to do. And our Congress decided that we're going to throw our lot in with the rest of the colonies, and we're going to fight for our freedom. Congress decided that they're going to raise two regiments of infantry and one of cavalry. Uh, well, I think I'm going to throw my lot in with these men. And I put my name in to be elected. Sure enough, I was actually surprised. Fifth out of 20, he elected as captain. And along with Francis Marion, I was assigned to the 2nd South Carolina Regiment. I thought, this is great. I heard stories about these officers out there. This is going to be a wonderful opportunity. Except I didn't know one thing about being an officer. I knew how to manage my land. I knew how to take care of the, it had to be similar to that. So I would have to rely on these men like Marion and Ma, and these others who had already served during the French Indian War. I was assigned to light infantry company. Okay, what's that to me? That told me that they're the scouts. They're the ones with the eyes and ears of the regiment. And okay, what's the first thing I need to do? Go get your men. See, that's another thing they left out. See, they don't give you men once you form the regiment. As a captain, you go get your own men. Where am I supposed to go get these men? Go home. Go to the places you know. So I returned down to Georgetown region with a young lieutenant named Gabriel Marion. His nephew was assigned to me as a lieutenant in my command. So I went down there. I started recruiting up the men to become the nucleus of my company. We knew time was short. We knew Charleston would be a target of the British because of our port. Everyone's coming in. So we started to train in earnest. So again, you know, well, how am I supposed to be an officer? So not only am I training my men on proper discipline and tactics and what's exploited for them, but I had to figure this all out too. I didn't know how to be an officer. And we were using British regulations. So I had to sit down and go through the books and talk to these men. What am I supposed to do? And of course, you know, I hear these stories about captains and leading your men in battle. They seemed to left out all that garrison duty stuff that we had to do. I was on guard duty a lot, or especially now we're getting ready. We knew the British were coming, building defenses around Charleston. So I was doubting with my men, digging the holes, building the redoubts, working on Fort Sullivan and on the island. We started to get concerned. We knew the British were coming soon. So I was given the mission back in April of 76. We feel that there may be a British warship looking around near Bulls Island. So I was given the assignment to head north with my whole company. I knew it was serious then because they were issued full cartridge boxes, double flints, a barrel of biscuits, and a surgeon. That's the first time my company was actually given a surgeon to go with them. My order to go up by boat to Bulls Island to see what the British were doing. And if they were in fact on the island trying to secure provisions, I was to chase them off with my company. But my primary role was to collect intelligence find the British, make sure what their numbers were to get the information back. So we loaded up the boats, and we went up the river, and we got to Bulls Island and found nothing. But following my orders, I set up my camp. I did what they told me to do. I set my perimeter, my pickets, and we walked for several days. Didn't see a soul. Marched back down the island, went back to Charleston, and went back to work. Well, later on, about on September 10th, or June, excuse me, Deserters from the British Navy came by and told us, you've got problems coming your way. British land forces up on Long Island, they're planning to come across. So once more, my company, because we were light infantry, we can move fast, we were given the order, you will march to the north of the island, you will support Thompson in the 3rd South Carolina, shoulder our muskets, put on our packs, and off we marched. We got to the north of the island and looked across the breach going, I don't know how they're getting across. I don't see any boats. I guess someone told them that you could wade across the breach inlet at low tide, it's only waist level. And it must be the size of a giant, because last time I checked, I even had head tide that's seven plus feet deep in there. So we sat there, we watched across the inlet, we could see the tents off in the distance, and we could see them watching us. Nothing happened. So once more, I packed up my men, and we headed back down. And that's when we knew the big invasion was coming. So we all were inside Fort Sullivan, the great fleet started to come around on June 28th. Now the port wasn't finished. Most of it was finished. 
but not the back of the fort. We're being concerned with, all, with the British Navy and all their guns. We can fix that side of the fort first. But we're still concerned about Fort Wallace. 2,800 plus British soldiers that could come around and attack us from the rear. So we had a gate, just didn't have anything in the gate. So my men are picking up anything that was loose, barrels, and wood, and chunks of lumber, and we piled up and we provided this gate, and the shells started to fly. Folks, I'm sure you've been down there in the coast when it's in the heat of the summer. It's not comfortable to begin with, let alone inside a fort, with large cannonballs are flying all over the place. My company was held in reserve. We stayed inside the fort with Mary and the rest of the men around the ramparts of the fort, firing off gun guns at a slow, easy pace. Oh, we figure that during the siege, General Lee wants to come out and inspect the fort. And wow, well, we were a little busy at the time, but the general said to come out, so my company was assigned the task of tearing down that improvised barricade to allow him inside. So under fire, my men went out there and pulled down that barricade. In the process, two of my men were wounded. Uh, Mr. Sam Gale and Sergeant Young, but we opened the door, General Lee came in and said, what a fine job we were doing. And it was fine enough that the British turned around, they went home. Now I'm sure you all heard the tale from Weems, how Marion fired the last shot from the fort, passed through the rear of the ship, took the pants off the Admiral. Far from the truth. I believe in Lieutenant Schubert, the final man to shot. I don't think he actually passed through the rear of the ship and decided to fall about that big and not pass through somebody and just remove the pants that usually the leg and the rest of the body is going with it. But by the end of September, we were a full Continental Regiment. Two finest colors presented to us. Now we're ready to serve and do our duty for the colonies. I got promoted. So now I'm not just a captain anymore. I'm a major. Which really means I get to do more staff work. And so they didn't really tell me that part either with the congratulations, now you're promoted. You're now a member of the staff. Now I get to sit on things like parole boards and court martials and be officer of the day and everything else. But we were still preparing our army to get ready for eventually when we went to go after the British. General Lincoln decided that we had to do something about Savannah. And now that we had the French allies, and we're going to do something about it. I got lucky again. I got promoted to Kirk. Now I have my own regiment. They give me command of the 5th. So as one combined force, us and the French, we marched south to Savannah. And folks, I'll tell you plan. I have never seen a more backwards, organized siege ever conducted on a military operation. The French want to do it by the old European style. Negotiate, talking to the British, comparing orders. And we're sitting there watching the defenses just get thicker, deeper, heavier. They only had one French engineer with him who knew what he was doing. Unfortunately, he got killed halfway through the siege. So now other guys are out there trying to build these batteries. The artillery was not even hitting the target. Some of them were rocking their, their rounds on top of their own guys. And then the batteries themselves fell apart because they weren't well made. So Lincoln decided that we're going to take Savannah by infantry force. My column went around the far left. They told me, don't worry, the guy knows what he's doing. He's from there. I don't know where he's been, but about we got so deep in that swamp, we couldn't find one way out or the other. And then, of course, we're trying to a surprise attack so that we'd have the, at least that element to our you know, benefit. And some French company decided that they were in the wrong position. They were the more senior company and should be on the right side of the column. So with vice playing and drums banging, they walked across the whole front to take up their proper position. Uh, I think the British knew we were coming. When we finally broke out of the swamp, front, you know, the sun was up, they could see it, but we shouldered our muskets and we charged towards that Spring Hill Redoubt. My men did well. I could see my old colors of the Second South going over the top there, planting in that redoubt. Through the little bit I could see from the smoke and the carnage, as the men were just being shot to pieces. One color cracked, then the second color. We couldn't hold it anymore. We couldn't punch through. We lost a lot of men that day. I'm sitting there watching these crumbled bodies out of this field, and this was so much a mistake. My men had to pay that price. Next day, when I'm on roll call, they were trying to find out how many men I had left. One in five weren't answering their names anymore. So it was a slogan army that we marched back to Charleston. My unit was so decimated that they took my regiment, combined it with the first. I'm out of a job. 
Not much I can do except provide some staff assistance in the city. But without a job or side, you know, see Emma Charlton, perhaps I should just go home, rest, and recuperate a little bit. Because while I was at home, I realized the work got to me that the city had actually fallen. And I was riding down there, and people were trying to tell me, you better not go. The British have it now. But word did get to me that some escaped, to include my friend Francis Mary. Broke the bank somehow. But he was being moved from house to house. Cornwallis decided that he's going to solidify his command in the South. He started sending out these columns of troops to 96, Camden. And we got old Bloody Band himself coming down to Georgetown to secure that area to make sure there's not nothing was left. There weren't very many. We went underground, hiding in the swamps, moving at night. But we were able to find where Marion was and we linked up with him. Word finally got down to us, the hero himself, the savior of Saratoga, was marching south with a new army. He was coming down to free us from this oppressor of Cornwallis. So being the good officers that we were, we rode north to meet up with this new army. By the time we got there, and we linked up on the August, I have to say we were about a sorry sight to see. Trying to live in the swamps, live off the land, moving at night. Even this best of clothes doesn't survive well. The biggest thing I always remember about was wet. Always, always wet. I could never dry off because I could never really dig up my clothes and dry because at any moment we could be hit by Tarleton or any other patrols. The clothes just rotted off us. When we rode in the gates of camp, there was only about 20 of us left. Mostly young men, black and white. The only thing on that didn't rot off, our helmets. The rest of us, some were naked, some were in tatters. You got the whole new version of being saddle sore after a long day of riding up north. <laughs> but when we got there, Gates didn't know what to do with us because we didn't look like continental officers anymore. We looked like a bunch of ragamuffins coming out of the swamps. Which we were, a bunch of ragged men coming out of the swamps. <clears throat> so he didn't know what to do with us. Well, down in the Georgetown region, British had took it. Major John James started organizing the resistance because Tarleton was running loose and he's starting to burn the houses. So he was able to organize four companies of militia ready to go. But he wasn't very experienced as a leader. So he sent a message up the gates because I need an officer down in this region who understands how to conduct warfare who's experienced. For gates, this was a win-win situation. I'm supporting James and I'm getting rid of this ragged buffins of Mary and his men. Because we were, we could walk around the camp, we could see these Continentals laughing at us, you know, we were rather threadbare, things were hanging out that shouldn't be hanging out. <laughs> things were pretty rough. So Gates assigns Marion, you will go down to the Williamsburg district and you will take charge, you will spread the word. And I am coming south to liberate them from the British oppressors. Marion took his orders like a good officer, we assembled what little supplies we could, and we rode off. We arrived in the Williamsburg district. We, Marion really didn't have the authority to take charge of the militia. But he did anyways, because he's that type of person. Those, not only those four companies came to our, to our rally to our call, but other men who knew Marion, who had served with us before in the second start, to rally to our call. And that's when we got the word that the hero of Saratoga got crushed at Camden by Cornwallis. Of course, I have to say, it was impressive that a man of his stature and age could ride from Camden to North Carolina for three days. That's pretty good for a man uh, like that. So we knew we're now we were it. We had to do something about Cornwallis and his men. So we learned from a deserter that a column of prisoners were being marched to Charleston. So we got on our horses. We met him at Nelson's Ferry. Gave him what for? Not only did we free those prisoners, we captured about 23 of them. Unfortunately, because of our ragged state, I think a lot of these returned prisoners said, boy, the war must be going really bad if this is what they're sending down to rescue us. By the time we got back to friendly control, all but three had deserted us. The fact that we did this under the British nose didn't sit well, and they decided to send Major James Weems and his 63rd from Georgetown make sure that we wouldn't do it again. We knew they were coming, we just weren't too sure how big they were. So we sent Major James to go out there and take a look at this British force, and he came back on. They're big. There's a lot more of them than us. 
So we aired in this night of caution, we got on our horses, and we left. We rode to Amy's Mill across North Carolina and Rounding Creek and waited time out. So we pick the right time to get the end. Is while we're up there.